Uh, Neuralink. You you, tem- <laughs> you said you, you promised me some some good info on Neuralink. Uh, for the people at home that don't know anything about Neuralink, they might know that it's a, some company that Elon has. Uh, yeah. What's what's the high level quick spiel on the company uh, for for those that don't know? Uh, Neuralink is a brain computer interface, and it's a it's a brain computer interface of the highly invasive Bio-hacking. variety. Bio-hacking. Yeah, it involves actually you know <laughs> cutting a hole in you know in the in the skull and connecting something directly to brain tissue. Yeah. Didn't um, they do something like that for Terminator? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember pulling a chip out of the back of Terminator's head. You know? Yeah, it that was a deleted scene, neural actually. network. I remember that was back when neural networks were out of favor. Too. So people in the neural networking community were, see the Terminator. Yeah, thing. see, there you um, go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, brain computer interfaces are a way to uh, build a piece of hardware that actually directly interfaces to brain tissue. Um, it, um, uh, I get how it's, should we just talk about the technical stuff? And this story is really long about like, why does Elon think that this is worth doing the first people who are going to get it, where they eventually want to go. It is a, it is a pretty long story. Um, there ultimately, it looks like what they're doing is they're trying to lay the foundation technology for being able to build something which is an extremely high bandwidth interface to the brain for use in human beings. Uh, where they're starting out is with a really small device that gets implanted. It, they basically take a, a, a piece of your cranium about the size of a quarter out and it is replaced by this device that has an electrical interface on the back, on the bottom, which is plugged into the brain tissue that sits underneath that. Um, it's, it sits, once it's installed, you can't see it. Like it's, you, the skin just goes right back over the top of it. It functions as a replacement for the bone that it's, that it's substituted for. It's like when someone gets a plate a, in their head. It's just, instead of just being a, a plate that does yeah. nothing, it's a plate with a chip on it. <laughs> It's, it's probably not as strong, actually, if you, you look at the structure of the thing. Like a cranial implants that are designed to be structural are, are stronger than a neural link is. And so that's probably something that they'll have to deal with at some point. But and it, and it has a wireless interface. They're using Bluetooth right now. So it allows you know tissue in your brain to talk directly to your phone, essentially, or your computer or whatever the deal is. And it's a two-way interface. Directly to my that, brain? That would, that would bother me, given how AirPods. badly my AirPods work. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how Bluetooth <laughs> in my head. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the promise of the tech. And so in the short run, it's, uh, it's an, the implant can solve problems for people who have very serious uh, problems with uh, either their, their brain or their, or their spine. So the classic example is like people who are, who are uh, locked in or quadriplegics who basically don't yeah. have any control. Yeah. You don't have to give them very much control uh, in order to radically improve their quality. Like just being able to talk if you can't talk is a huge, is a huge thing. But um, let me ask you, um, you know, what, what are they doing or what have they done yet that is actually new? Like, I, I feel like 10, maybe longer years ago, I saw, you know, video of a monkey playing Pong yeah. with uh, a wire in his head. And, yeah, that was done um, in, the, in the, as far back as like the early nineties, it had been done, but that, that yeah. was a single, that was a single. So the big thing that Neuralink is doing, and this is a thing that is important is they're putting a lot of probes in like right now they're putting in 1024 probes. Um, the, the, there's another device called a Utah array and it has a hundred probes. And so that was considered really large. And prior to that, almost all the work in the space was two or three or four, mostly one probe. Um, the more probes you get into the tissue, the more reliably you can get more nuanced information in and out of the brain. So, uh, the, also, the more probes that you get, the less training it takes, the sooner the user can make use of it. If, if you put a single probe in, it can take a lot of training for people to learn to, to turn something on and off. It takes a lot of practice with biofeedback and whatnot before you get the hang of doing it. The more probes you put in, the, you know, the, the, more, the better chance you have of being able to quickly get 
to some level of functionality. It, it still requires training to learn to use the interface. But instead of it being like learning Chinese, now it's like, you know, learning to type on a keyboard or something like something you can learn in a couple of hours instead of something that you might have to spend years doing. But it's like the opposite of a neural net training. It's like, oh, you have more yeah. parameters. Yeah. It takes less time. Wait, what? <laughs> it, it is exactly <laughs> neural net training, but the neural net in your head is the part that's doing the training. You have right. to learn to use your brain to use the interface, right? right. So like Makes these sense. interfaces, there's two sides of this interface. There's you know, it's an interface between a machine and a brain and both sides are adaptive systems and they have to learn to talk to each other. And so there's a process that goes on at the brain side where the brain learns to use the interface. And there's, you know, a software process that goes on at the other end where the, where the software and the system has to learn to talk to the part of the brain that's trying to learn to talk to it. You know, that, that's basically the process that goes on. Ultimately, they're going to want to be able to install things that have millions of probes. Um, but a thousand is a lot more than a hundred, especially because the Utah array, the Utah array, it was a fixed grid of 10 by 10 probes that, which is, that has the downside that you've just got this grid and you're just sticking it in the brain. And one of the downsides installing stuff in the brain is the brain has lots of blood vessels. And if you hit a blood vessel, when you put something in, then you mm -hmm. cause, you know, bleeding in a cranium. And that degrades the function of the probe, and it also potentially causes an injury to the brain. So one of the things that Neuralink is doing, is they actually have a robot. They've built a robot that does the surgery. And what the robot does after it opens a cranium, like it looks at the brain tissue and it can see where all the blood vessels are. And then it sticks the probes in one by one, and it specifically puts them in places that aren't going to cause injury to the brain. So it's much safer procedure. And they're also able to get more value out of every probe they put in because they're able to, to pick good spots for the probes instead of just being, you know, essentially shotgun scatter shot into a chunk of brain tissue, which is what you get with Utah, right? Safety is the obstacle, right? It's when you, no the brain is a really <laughs> sensitive piece of tissue and bodies generally uh, are really sensitive to things that you put into them. That's why there's only a couple of different materials that are reasonably biocompatible. That's why, you know, implants are always stainless steel or titanium, right? That's like most materials you stick in the body, the body will reject. You'll have an immune response to it. Your body will build a callus over it. And this is also true of brain implants. So like one of the challenges you, I mean, brain surgery is dangerous, right? Exposing, exposing the brain. The brain is super, super susceptible to infection. So like, that's something that you have to control really carefully. Um, you know, it's very, very fragile tissue. It's un, I mean, your, your brain is like, it has, it's the consistency of jello. It's really, really soft. So it's very easy to damage it. Um, bleeding in the brain is a big problem. Like there's all kinds of obstacles from a safety standpoint to getting this there from an efficacy standpoint, brain computer interfaces they're pretty well demonstrated to be efficacious in the sense that you can get them in there, people can learn to use them and they can get real functionality out of it. But if the, if the brain tissue has an immune response to it, that functionality will degrade over time because the brain will find those individual electrodes and it'll wrap a little sheath around it to protect itself from the electrode and then it stops working. So they need to, to main, you know, so they've got a lot of hurdles to clear in terms of safety. And then you want the efficacy to last, you want the function to last long enough to justify the risk that a patient takes in installing this thing. So uh, those are big hurdles. It's going to take a while to, to clear that stuff. I, I would hope that technology would, uh, would advance enough that uh, we're able to do this sensing somewhat remotely, like with a proximity sensor, as opposed to uh, you know, so, directly having to need physical contact, yeah. like some kind of it's, squid, you know, super conducting. Uh, it, so it's you funny know, you bring that up. They device. just released a thing on fMRIs used with stable diffusion, right? Did, yeah. did oh, you yeah, see that, yeah, Doug? Sure, I saw that. So yeah, yeah. using fMRI data, they were able to mostly reproduce the image of what the visual cortex was seeing. Well, they can make a picture I've, of a similar I've, thing. I've, I've <laughs> a picture of a similar thing. But still, that's, that's in, impressive uh, doing it remotely without any surgery. Yeah. But yeah, the problem I is you can't do inputs. fMRI uh, type uh, studies before just, you know, for fun, you know, for like at the psych department at Stanford or whatever. Um, I just don't, that would be great if you could have like a, yeah, I don't know, some kind of cap that gives you some fMRI type thing. Uh, yeah, maybe in the far future that no, they're, they're medical to... diagnostic equipment. I, I actually, I designed an auditory brain response amplifier, which was one of these things that you, 
where, you know, you have a skull cap that goes on and it's mm -hmm. got a bunch of probes and you attach them to your head and then you can read the neurological response to stimulus and it's used to diagnose various sorts of neurological problems. That's got to be uh, fairly it, low resolution, right? It's got a, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't make a great brain computer interface because it takes mm -hmm. a lot of training to use it and the output is pretty crude and whatnot, but people do it. Like there have been, you can buy a video game you know, you can buy accessories for video games that you can play with your brain that are similar. You know, it's there are a couple of electric uh, probes that you tape to your skull. But well, I, I've seen uh, not that this is represented representative, but I've certainly seen some of these things like I'll go to uh, Maker Faire some years ago mm -hmm. and somebody had something. And, you know, to me, it was just snake oil because you're supposed to put it on and I was going to show your brain waves and I could just take the thing and just sort of touch the electrode and get ooh some fancy brain waves uh, yeah. just from the I don't know whatever ground loop or whatever my yeah. my uh, my fingers generate. It's this the electrical signals like trying to read what a brain is doing through the skull is hard. The signals coming out of individual neurons are really really tiny. Um, and you know, if you're trying to read an electrical field at the surface of the brain, well, we live in a world that's full mm. of all this noise, it's like separating out the brain signal from from all the interference in the environment, it's super hard to do. And the, you know, that was the task that I had to do with that ABR. And like, when we when we would test people, we put them in Faraday cages. You know, I was like, gonna say, all you have to do is put work. a tinfoil hat on top of the cat. <laughs> yeah. And that will that will take Where's out all Mark? the CIA rays. <laughs> Where's Mark? He was the king of tinfoil hats. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. it's hard. And people do it. You can do it with light too. Like there are devices mm -hmm. that essentially they shine an infrared light through the skull, right? And you can look at the at the behavior. There's a, I forget what. Um, there's a company that make that's making a, a fairly serious go at building one of the, uh, building a sensor that's got like 50 probes that you can use uh, via essentially optical reading the state of the brain. It's also crude. It's fast, mm. so it's not, and you can just put it on. So that's one of the nice things about it. But getting the alignment perfectly right and the algorithm to get meaningful amount of data in and out, well, out as you can only read out on on that one. But yeah, it's so, uh, back, back to Neuralink and specifically, you know, that uh, what they're doing there. I mean, do you have a sense that they're going at the right pace? Are they, you know, is safety a uh, uh, something they're really considering or do they push that aside to keep moving forward or, you know, how do you, how do it's you an feel? Elon like, company, so. Yeah. It's an Elon company. Right? <laughs> it, I think safety, they're working what's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're working at a breakneck pace, but safety is, is a super critical component. I, I think they do care about it. I mean, they care about it in the cars, right? They really, I mean, my sense looking at the cars and looking at the stats, they put a lot of effort into trying to make the cars safe. Um, the FDA has a really high bar to clear on this stuff. I think if they get past the FDA, it's very likely going to be fine from a safety standpoint. So we're thinking just ballpark this decade for medical related stuff and some decades later for possibly a wider audience, do you think? Or do you think it's more, it's closer than that? I, it like I don't know what safety problems they might be dealing with right now. Like sure. the if the, if the FDA hasn't let them go, then the FDA has got some specific concerns that they've enumerated and that they're working on. So if it's you know say for instance that the material that they're using as an insulator is turning out not to have good biocompatibility, that that might be you know back to the drawing board for an important part of the system, and that could take quite a while to get passed. If on the other hand, the FDA is like, you know, uh, we want you to prove that the software doesn't have bugs of, of this variety or whatnot, that might be something that they can solve more quickly. So like I could see them having it in patients this year. Like I wouldn't be surprised at all if they got there. I also wouldn't be surprised if it takes five years before the FDA signs off on it at for because it's a medical treatment. It's not a research device. Right. Now, if at approval as a research device is kind of a different thing and you can do that. And I think like, actually, I don't know what the status of the Utah array is. I, there's the, there, there's a not, it's not exactly a brain computer interface. There's, there's, there are devices that are used for treating epilepsy and for treating, uh, 
depression, which just have a couple of probes, but they have to go really deep in the brain and they've been around for a while, but the only candidate, the only people who are candidates for that procedure, are people who have essentially really, really severe problems. I think it's going to take a while. And, and I, I'd be surprised if, if, uh, if it was available to like a, a lay, you know, to people who want it for augmentation inside in like 20 years.